All right. Um, yeah, welcome everyone to the November Torch Malaria Community Meeting. Uh, in this meeting, we'll go over, you know, uh, some monthly stats. Vivek is going to give you some workload updates, you know, on the, the different models that uh, they've been able to get working through Torch IR. And then we'll have Stanley here present on the work that he's been doing, uh, getting ear mode in uh, Shark Turbine. Um, so, uh, but before we get to that, a few reminders. So last month we started this new uh, schedule for our meetings. We added a developer hour at 5 p.m. Pacific time in order to cover more time zones. Um, and so that's the only change. It's the second and fourth Monday of the month at 5 p.m. And we now have also a Google Calendar that you can um, add to your calendar so that everything is you know, in sync uh, and kept track for you. Um, as usual, if you have any questions or uh, topics you want to discuss, a good place to, to bring them up is on Discord. But we also have office hours and our you know, mo uh, meeting Mondays. Uh, this is uh, the commit statistics for this last month. Uh, so thank you, everyone, who has been working really hard in Torch MLIR. All the contributions are very welcomed. And with that, I will pass it on to Vivek to talk about some workload updates. Yeah, hi all, welcome. So regarding the workload updates in the last meeting, uh, we talked about the Falcon 180B GPTQ running. So the apart from the 180B, we also have the 40B running as well through the Torch MLIR, both sharded and unsharded on the CPU uh, and the Rockum as well. On It's running on the Rockum. So apart from this, the turbine in the last meeting, uh, Stella talked about that in detail. So we have the Llama 2 supporting, supported through that. That is, is still a work in progress. Uh, we would soon have that working through turbine. So the turbine uses the dynamo and all those stuff. So that would also be pretty much kind of uh, a good thing that we have. So the another thing is that uh, because of some tweaks in auto GPTQ transformers, uh, we can now get uh, any of the quantized model, the native quantized model from GPTQ it's imported uh, uh, like uh, we can just compile it via the torch MLIR. Uh, we, we just don't need to worry about the things happening inside that because we have made the required changes. So that is another thing like it has opened a lot of opportunities to run large models and the quantized versions of them with limited resources. Yeah. That's awesome. Uh, for Lama 2, is that using the AOT path or the JIT path? You know? Yeah, so that is through that uh, the conventional make FX path through which we are supporting all the other models. But through Dynamo also, it should work, I hope so. Gotcha, yeah. Awesome, that's, that's really cool that, I mean, these models are the biggest LLMs that uh, yeah, and and this and this Falcon 180B is already supported through Shark. So if anyone wants to just uh, try this out, so they can just try this out using the Shark. We would have the others supported as well. Cool. Awesome. Thank you, Vivek. Yeah. Okay. And with that, uh, we can go on to Stanley's presentation. Sounds good. Thanks, Vivek and Ramiro. Um, quick intro. My name is Stanley. Is well, I worked at Nod, which then now becomes part of AMD. Um, and yeah, you know, uh, we've recently started working on Python. Well, we call it Turbine Eager Mode. So it's a uh, Eager Mode through Turbine, and underneath we're using Torch MLIR to do some compilation. Uh, yeah. So I think the first slide, I mean, this is the today's content. I'll give a talk a bit about what this eager mode, the general system overview, the anatomy of the turbine tensor, which is really one of the core pieces here. 
um, intercept in torch operations, as in how do we, you know, uh, catch torch operations? Because for those who know, torch mostly work through dispatches. Uh, the compilation pipeline, the async execution pipeline, and future works. That will go to um, what is eager mode. So, what is eager mode? I mean, this I just take off the PyTorch's website, uh, but eager mode essentially is the base mode that the default mode that most people use when they start using PyTorch. For example, when you just type out torch.tensor, and you can evaluate the value right away, or torch.random, and evaluate the value right, right away. That's kind of eager mode, as opposed to how most, I think, compiler-focused work is usually in graph mode, where we do kind of, you know, torch.compile, and then we go, let it go through FX or JIT script. And, you know, it's just a, it's kind of a ahead of time compilation, while eager mode kind of just executes on the spot everything. Well, it's not really performant compared to torch.compile. I think it's a really important mode to support because it's a, well, it's a default mode for PyTorch. And it's also kind of, um, it's, when you first start learning PyTorch, this is how you're going to do PyTorch. And I think a lot of ML researchers and ML scientists who don't really care, at least for um, inference speed or training speed, when they first do some experimentation, they'll probably use eager mode because it's just more ergonomic and it makes it easier to kind of like debug your code. Um, we'll go to the, now we could go to the next page. So how do we do eager mode on Turbine? This is kind of the systems overview or the bird eye view of what's actually happening. So we first start off with PyTorch, right? And from PyTorch, you kind of get a torch tensor and a torch tensor, we are actually able to, with some Python magic, we can actually uh, do a dot to the dot two function as you would for like, say, hey, you generate a tensor, you do dot two CUDA and you get a CUDA tensor. So we do something very similar, but instead of dot two CUDA, we do something called dot two turbine. And that converts the PyTorch tensor into some a turbine tensor. And once you have a turbine tensor, well, you can apply it torch functions on it. Like, you know, you could feed it torch.add or torch.matmol, or you could even do a dot two on an NN module. Say you have a whole network, you do a dot two. And then if you, for example, a, have an input to a model and then do a dot two as well, of course, um, and you apply kind of the forward function on it, it'll go through the turbine tensor dispatcher. Um, so once you feed in your turbine tensor and torch function to a turbine tensor dispatcher, it kind of takes, it kind of analyzes your turbine tensor shapes and your torch function, and it'll be able to, it'll be able to um, compile your dispatch based on the shape, the D types, and the torch function itself. I think the kind of fun part about this is we can kind of like cache it. Right, so the first time you compile it, yeah, it's not, you'll take some time to compile it, but after a while in that session, you'll be able to just cache it, and next time it's kind of like free, you just kind of launch it. Um, so once you feed the turbine sensor and torch function into this sensor dispatcher, and you compile it out, you get a turbine executable, which for you eerie geeks, it's a turbine, which is basically a wrapped up VMFB. Um, which you can launch. And then you feed this turbine executable or VMFP into our turbine runner. And in return, you'll get the HAL buffer view and then HAL fence. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, eating geeks with kind of like HAL buffer view and HAL fence. But for those who doesn't quite know, HAL buffer view is kind of a, it's a class to represent data on device. And it kind of gives you the base pointer. Oh, you know where the base pointer is, and you'd know the shapes and the strides of it. Uh, you'd also get a fence because if we run asynchronously, you kind of want to know when the when the 
tensors ready to be consumed. Um, yeah, so if you guys have any questions about this picture, you could also ask, uh, but if not, I'll continue on. I have a question. Maybe you'll get to this later on, but how big can a torch function be? Is it just usually like one up or like can you actually capture a, a bigger graph? Ah, awesome question. So yes, uh, there's two ways you could do about this. So this is also future work that I'm super excited about. Um, so by default, we would go through this patch level. So say you get a linear level. What happened underneath is PyTorch will say, hey, this is a linear layer. We're going to dispatch a B at MM and a transpose. Well, a transpose and then a B at MM. And then that's a torch dispatch level, right? You get that torch so A times the transpose and A times B at MM. And we take that and we compile it one by one. So it's at the op level. But there's a way you could actually register a function and say, hey, once you register a function, Called, I think we call it compute factory. Um, if you register it as a compute factory and say, hey, I want this function to be kind of, uh, I want this function to be kind of compiled together, it'll go through essentially a similar pipeline as uh, you regularly would. But it, it would still be a torch function level. So it won't be super, you know, I guess if you want to keep the autograd, but that's a bit far later. But for inference, obviously, you could, uh, you could wrap your function over anything. Um, but that's also future work to kind of figure out how to get the autograph working for these larger functions. Cool. Thanks. Yes, Vivek. So I have a question here. Like, so interestingly, you have written and said that uh, if if the op is already seen, then we can uh, just use that from the cache, right? Yes. So uh, uh th there might be some ops which are dependent on the inputs or something like that so won't that matter i mean is it independent of that no like it's, how is it, that how that works i mean yeah so it's not it's uh so what we have is we actually have this uh unordered map and we kind of cache the functions to the executable based on their based on the based on the inputs, like the number of inputs, and we'll kind of like hash this, the number of in, the inputs, and then the shape and the D type, and then after that, the torch, the op name. So that way, say you have a F16 and in eight, and they, they have exact same shape, that won't pass through, right? Or the number of input change, then that won't pass through either. Or the, yeah, yeah. Or the shape ordering change that also wouldn't pass through. But, so, so uh, mm -hmm. all those things has to be same. Only then uh, they they would the cache the cache one would be used. Exactly. Otherwise, it would just do the compilation again. Exactly, exactly. Because as of now, we're compiling it to a static shape. So when you do a you know a linear of five twelve to thirty two, it will give you a mathmol of five twelve to thirty two uh it it yeah it's very static uh so once you see another shape they'll kind of like take it out and also the obviously the the shape is static the detox also static but that's also another cool feature work is to kind of pre-generate some of the uh dynamic shapes in advance or we could generate dynamic kernels in advance and then we can kind of like First pass, you just add it through the dynamic kernel, and then the background we can kind of add a something to just start compiling these shapes, just in case they use it again. And then when they use it again, then they'll get an optimized shape. Understood. Also, th thanks for that. No worries. Nice. So it seems like I think most people that's a good pass on the system overview um you can go to the next page so yes how do we intercept python chops so python chops usually go by two different form of uh functionality or two different levels one is at the dispatch level and one's at the function level so we need actually both at the functional level we can create a custom torch function mode 
So using a by creating a torch function mode, you can essentially it's a it's supported by PyTorch by the way. So PyTorch give this mode for people who wants to, I guess, uh, have their own custom backend. So this actually allows us to intercept uh, PyTorch operations and then kind of like reroute them or like customize them as we like. So what's happening here for us at least is we have um, we have a dictionary of of um, these implementations like dot two dot mt ones and zeros, and then we use the storage function to kind of intercept these operations, and then we'll check the dictionary for like hey dot two do we have an implementation of that, and if we do we kind of like feed that to that implementation. But the same dictionary is actually uh, we're using the same dictionary to uh, for the torch dispatch as well. So at the lower level where they do have a dispatch and obviously the dot two function, uh, you know, doesn't have a dispatch. That's why we need to keep it in touch function. But for example, like linear layer and torch.mal and torch.add, we can actually not use the torch function and use the torch dispatch. This is actually a bit easier because you don't need to register as much stuff and we can automatically, you know, uh, see, hey, this is a torch function. Uh, this is a A10 add. I know how to compile an A10 add. Um, and this is actually, uh, to do this, we use something called, uh, there's this function called torch underscore dispatch underscore. And by setting this inside the custom tensor class, when you apply any function to the torch this to that tensor class or this custom tensor class, which we have for turbine tensor, It'll go through this torch dispatch kind of like a wrapper function, and then inside this torch dispatch function, we can kind of decide, okay, what do we want to do with this? Either that, or you could also register torch dispatch mode. That's kind of similar to torch function mode, but obviously it's for dispatches, and we use it for you know lower level ops such as ATAN B at MM, ATAN at ATAN Matmol, transpose conf two D. Um, yeah, any questions for this page? Nope, sounds good. I think that's quite straightforward, hopefully. And oh yeah, so if you guys are reading back on this page, if you guys are watching it through recording, if you just go to the slides, there's the tensor.ui link here. And if you open it, you can check out the source code right away. Well, so now we're at the Compilation pipeline. So, how does this get compiled? Uh, essentially, let's actually go through regular, you know, ERI or Torch level compilation. So, we go from PyTorch and then we feed it Torch op and then we feed it kind of um, list of input shapes and D types uh, into Dynamo. We also, the Torch op, we actually need to wrap around a a function um, just because Dynamo is not very happy uh, with regular torch op being simply export. Like, you know, we use Dynamo.export. So if you feed in torch op op directly into Dynamo.export, Dynamo won't be very happy about it. So what we do is we create this function wrapper um, inside our inside our method to go like, hey, like you have a certain torch op, we'll feed this torch op. And wrap it around a function, and that way it's very easily compilable from Dynamo. Once we feed it through Dynamo, we can put it. Uh, we'll generate an FX graph. This FX graph will generate. You know, we'll feed that into Torch MLIR, and we'll get a Linux MLIR, and we'll feed it to ERI compiler to generate a VMFB, and we wrap it up around the turbine executable Python class. And yeah, I think once we go through this pipeline, um, if we see certain shapes and types and torch op before, um, we don't recompile them. We just cache them and just we just kind of like return the cached turbine executable wrapper. So yeah, uh, any questions for this page? Or does this make sense? Sounds good. 
Um, we'll go to the next page. So anatomy of the turbine tensor. So for turbine eager mode, this is quite one of the crux of it, is um, how do we store the data as a turbine tensor? So turbine tensor to the users would actually look just like a torch tensor, because that's the only way you initialize it, essentially. You do a torch tensor, random, or you know you generate a torch tensor from somewhere, and then you do a dot to turbine. So to users, to end users, it looks just like a torch tensor, which makes it super ergonomic. Um, but the central number of variables is the storage class. So this, the storage and the storage class, well, the storage is a member of a turbine storage class, uh, has basically three different um, member, well, key members at least, has a buffer, which is how buffer, where, you know, it's a eerie binded how buffer, where um, it is that where the data actually is. We have a ready fence. So the ready fence, again, is, to, is so you can query it and to see, hey, if the data is ready to be consumed or not, as well as a sync fence. So the sync, if you do a dot sync, function on it, it'll actually, you know, uh, be a blocking call to make sure that that data is ready. Um, so this function is actually useful, for example, if you want to do a, if you want to evaluate that right away, or if you want to do a, I don't know, once you have a pretty print, if you want to print it out, you want to sync the data first, and then you want to print out the values. Cool. And the second part of it is the buffer view. So the buffer view here is really, we mainly use it to keep track of the shape and data uh, and the D type of the data because the HAL buffer doesn't really contain a shape and D type. It contains just a pointer to the data. Awesome. And then the essential member methods, which we use for turbine tensor is CPU. So this allows us to generate a new torch tensor from the turbine tensor, a from torch, which allows us to generate a new, I guess, turbine tensor from PyTorch, dot empty, which I just allocates a empty memory on the device, and zeros and ones, which kind of does a fill to the device. But these, from these kind of like essential building blocks, we can build a lot of stuff on top of it. Any questions on turbine tester? This is, this is pretty cool. I didn't know you could do this with defining your own tensor. So you can do like the whole computation without your tensors ever leaving. Your exactly. Device. Yes, exactly, exactly, exactly. So you have it on device all the time, which is super cool. Yeah. And I think Stella and I were talking about how do we Say you have a PyTorch, who that answer? How do we transfer it over seamlessly without going back to false and there? So that's kind of cool. Yeah, that's pretty cool. Cool. I think not no questions on turbine tensor. Um, so we'll move on. The async execution pipeline. So I think this is almost the last bit. Um, but for turbine eager mode, we want to run it asynchronously. So we want to make it essentially non-blocking is what we're really going for. And we try to overlap as much computation as we can. Um, so this is the algorithm of it. So I, I can give a high level overview. The high level overview is basically, um, say you have a torch function and then you'll go through or for every this, okay, I'll just go through the code. Uh, well, this is the pseudo code already. For every torch dispatch or every torch off, it'll go through the inputs. And those inputs will create a VM, VM list. Say we just have a list. And it'll check these, it'll check these inputs if it's ready or if it flags. And we'll keep that flags as a part of the input argument into um, our act into our VMFB or into our like executable. And then, uh, well, obviously feed the torch, the, the tensors as well. 
the tensors as well as the as an input to the to our turbine executable. But basically, what happens is when you launch this code, it'll be a non-blocking launch, but it will track. It'll wait for these fences to be ready or these fences from the inputs to be ready, and then and only then will it launch the actual code like inside. And we'll also feed it kind of like a signal fence. So as a what will happen is when you through this, you'll get this signal fence to kind of like indicate if this specific torch off is done. And we'll put this torch signal fence as a as a um as uh, the ready fence for the output tensors. That way, you know, with the new signal fence and the new uh, output tensors, you can create a new turbine tensor that has the data and also the information on when it's ready or not. And that's kind of like the general overview of it. Does anyone have any questions on the async execution pipeline? Is this something that regular PyTorch eager mode does, or is this just a this new? Is, yeah. uh, I not quite sure now, but it mm. didn't used to be like this. It used to be you need to remember. I don't know if you remember back in the days that you need to put a non-blocking equals to true kind of call uh, oh. in some areas. So I don't think so, but maybe I'm wrong. But this is how. This algorithm is essentially how eerie async execution is done. They, each operation, you'll get the output tensor and the fence, and then that will kind of like, based on that, you can kind of like wait on certain stuff. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. Any questions? Other questions on async execution pipeline? Sounds good. So how do you use eager mode and what do we have now? So currently, I think the most complex example we have is just an MLP model. Um, so you'll import torch as regular. And then once you have turbine installed, you can just do from shark turbine, the dynamo, import enable. You call this enable function. And then you just you know write the regular MLP class and just write you know, regular M equals MLP, instantiate it regularly, instantiate your input regularly, and then just do a, so the reference output is just so you can compare results, but really you don't need the reference output. Then the next thing is you just do a dot two turbine on your MLP model, and then you dot two turbines on your input, and you can actually generate an output from that. And we've actually validated it for its correctness. Um, you could go to the sample.py, just get the code and try to play around with it. Um, but yeah, it looks super similar to how you would do on a CUDA code, for example. Any questions for the sample code, I guess? If not, I can move on. But I think the so right now we only support a local pass CPU backend, uh, which is yeah, it's just a asynchronous CPU backend. But of course, in the future, we want to support all the backends that's available on Erie, like Metal, uh, Balkans per V, uh, CUDA, Rockham, obviously, um, and. When that happens, we would just need to do a dot two turbine slash, but not slash, the hyphen spur V or hyphen rocket. So I think that's the real, that's the most cool part, I think, of this is we will be able to get a um, all the backends that supported on Erie for free as eager mode. So once you support a backend on Erie, then you get an eager mode for free, which is super nice. The, All right. This uh, is a plan to have it work nicely if you use multiple Erie backends at the same time. Ah, uh, uh, yeah, that one. Oh, 
hopefully. Uh, but that's not on the roadmap yet. But that's a good that, that's that's a good thing to bring up. Actually, that's really cool. Um, yeah, maybe uh, because you know, for like the stuff like like H one hundred where they have the heterogeneous stuff, I think it'll be really cool to add. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, I think that's really cool. Uh, should put that on the roadmap as well. <laughs> um, so I think if we go to the next slide, this is future work. So we have a GitHub issue for kind of like the roadmap of what we want to do with eager mode. Um, so, you know, some of it is plumbed through trading. There's some training when I think when we do training, there's some issues when you run through end to end. Um, so we got to plumb it through and just fix up some bugs for it and then enable other ELA backend pop wanted. Uh, if anybody's interested, you know, to plumb it through. And then there's also local or file caching system. Right now we cache per kernel uh, or per session, but then once you close your PyTorch code or your Jupyter notebook, now you don't have any, now you gotta recompile it the next time you open it. Would be cool to cache the file uh, on file. Then next, so next time you close it and turn it on, you can reuse it right away. Um, another thing is to also implement a JIT script decorator. So right now it's torched up by up. And obviously that's not the most efficient way to do it. It'd be really cool to have a, this is also a stepping stone into lazy mode, I guess. It's if you have a decorator for JIT script or turbine.script or whatever, we want to be able to kind of like compile the whole thing um, without destroying autocrat because we still want to have training working, of course. Uh, so that is also really cool. And then once you have that, obviously the next step is lazy tensor, which Ramiro is super pro in. Maybe he would implement this. Um, then also fallback dynamic shape kernel. So you know now it's all static. How do we implement something you know dynamic and to kind of like hide the compile time at least for the first round? And then of course helps always wanted on adding more models like hugging face model inferences, hugging face model fine tuning, stable model, st stable diffusion, and fusion model training. I think that's all from my end. Uh, yeah, let me know if you have any questions. Cool, seems like none. Uh, but yeah, always, um, always available. Uh, you could reach out to me on, um, I think it's stanley.winata at amd.com if you have any questions on this. Or, you know, you could, if anyone's interested, you could contact me on the GitHub issue over there, which with a link on it. Thanks, guys. Yeah, thank you so much. Cool. Um, all right. So, lastly, uh, I wanted to check with people if they had any feedback as to how things were working towards Malaya at the moment. Uh, you know, if you have any issues with PRs or debugging or something's confusing, this is a good place to bring it up. Uh, you can also open a GitHub issue and we can address it there as well. Um, but yeah, is there any any topics people wanted to discuss? All right, <laughs> cool. Um, well, yeah, thank you so much, uh, Stan, for the wonderful presentation. Um, and yeah, I'll see you all on the next meeting. Thanks, Ramiro. <laughs>